Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty acts. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel and dance. Praise him with stringed instruments and flutes. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let us pray. O oh Lord, we pray that you would clean this house, O oh God. You whose word is like a lamp for our feet, lighting up this place, sweeping and searching every nook and cranny, we are drawn together by your call. Rejoice with me, for I have found the coin that I had lost. There is more joy in heaven, you tell us. There is joy in the presence of angels, made overflow into us today. Help these tongues to sing our praise of your glory and grace, and help us to hear your heavenly choir. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen. Do we have anyone that uh, has anything that they'd like to share at this time? It just seems like each day seems to be a blessing of some sort, whether it be rain or sunshine, cold or warm. I'm just glad that God is in charge of all of us. Anyone? Okay, if not, let us stand for the reading of the word of God from the book of 1 Peter, chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. Therefore, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether to the king as supreme or to the governors as those who are sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bondservants of God. Honor all people, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Amen. Shall we remain standing as we continue to worship God in song? You know, make sure I'm not. You know, we as a church don't always agree on everything, right? I mean, two people, I mean, me and my husband don't always agree on everything. Amen to that. So, <laughs> <laughs> what if we expect, right? You know, we're not going to always agree on everything, but we can agree on some very, very important basic things. And that's what we're going to be singing in this about in this song today. <laughs> in this time of desperation Thank you. 
going to have to sit down. We're still going to sing another song, but I want you to sit down because we're going to be learning this song. I know that's <coughs> hard work, but um, we've been trying over the years to bring good songs that you know, really have something to say, that you know, <coughs> express what we believe and um, give God glory. So uh, this is a song that comes from way down under from Australia. Uh, kind of a neat group called City of Light. Uh, not really a group, it's a church, basically, and they decided to write <laughs> songs for their church. And this one is one of them that kind of got out. And um, this is something that they said, and I, 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 I really thought it was good, so I, if you don't mind, I'll read this to you before we start learning this song. Because this song says, You have not I but Christ in me. And they said, Having Christ in us does not mean we do no, that we do no more work, and neither does it mean we do at all. Rather, we contend, and we contend with his energy. Even our final resurrection is made possible by the gift of Christ in us. He will bring us to glory. In our weakness, he is strong, and he will complete the work he has begun. He himself is within us, leading us home step by step. Every believer has been given this gift. It's worth singing about. Amen. And I agree with that. So we're going <laughs> to sing the first verse for you. Okay? So you just kind of sit back and listen. And then second verse, we want to welcome you in. And um, if you're not comfortable yet, wait till the third verse. Or wait till the fourth. Wha whatever makes you comfortable. Um, but by the fourth verse, you're pretty much going to have it, I think. Yeah. 
Just have a few announcements here. The deacon board will meet at noon today. And uh, Wednesday we have prayer and Bible study. And I, I want you to know all the prayer requests brought up here on Sunday morning, uh, to the best of my ability, uh, are once again prayed for on Wednesday evening along with others that have come up at that time. Next Sunday, we'll be having our uh, first quarter business meeting at uh, 12 o'clock, and I'll be here. May 1st, uh, we're having a church cookout. At, we're not having a potluck. Uh, we're going to have uh, just hot dogs and chips and a few other things. It's just time to get together out Bonfire. here. Bonfire, yes. And we'll, we'll see what happens there. So uh, May 15th, cleanup day. Do you have anything to say about that, Louie? Need some help. Need some help, okay. Then coming up May 30th is uh, Memorial Day picnic. <coughs> so just take note of that. That's a month, month and a half away. Any other announcements? Yes. <laughs> okay. Yesterday was SWAT Saturday up at the camp, and 
I got the pleasure of putting a thousand ducks all in rows with another volunteer, so I want you to know we have our ducks in a row. <laughs> I have tickets for you. Um, the tickets are $5 a piece. This is for the scholarship program where we worked really hard to raise money to send campers to camp. Um, they're $5 a piece. The race is May 1st, and they'll take those ducks, and for every ticket with a number, they will take a duck and make sure it gets put in the front end loader. They'll take that front end loader and dump it in the stream, and the ducks will float down the stream, unless water's too high and sort of raging. And the duck that crosses the line first is the winner. Um, first prize is $500, second is $200, third is 100 and anybody that would like tickets, Dave and I, either one can help you. Thank you. Okay. I imagine there'll be a duck for breakfast. I think there's lunch to follow, but I don't know what we're serving. If we had ducks for breakfast, we would have quackers and milk. <laughs> uh, uh, moving right along here. Uh, if there's no other announcements, let's take out our hymnals, the blue hymnals. Turn to page 19, to God be the glory, and stand as we sing. Number 19.
In the way of prayer concerns this morning, who would have unspoken requests? Others. Luke. My aunt Nella Shane Owen is uh, back in the hospital again. Um, she may have COVID again, and they will not let my uncle be able to see her now. And he keeps what he is uh, worried. Yeah. Anyone else? Uh, keep uh, Ronnie and Shannon in prayer. Both of them are feeling a little under the weather here just in the last couple of days. Um, I'm not necessarily sure what all is going on, but you know, you just said that they're not both not feeling real well. Before we pray, I do want to I want to share uh, one thing. If you pay attention to the news, it seems like every other day we've got another shooting somewhere, right? Um, and it's kind of dominating a lot of news coverage. Uh, just uh, on this Friday, uh, there was eight people that were um, killed, several injured at a FedEx facility in Indianapolis. Um, a couple of days before that, there was someone shot and killed locally uh, at a uh, Bob Evans in Canton, there was uh, someone who was shot. I think that person did not die, but they, yeah, um, she did. Uh, I saw a couple of days before that there was a shooting in Akron at a place of business also. Uh, and, you know, this is, it, it's tragic, uh, and it, it tends to dominate the headlines. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with, you know, political nature of the gun argument, unfortunately. Uh, but it's never fun or, you know, to hear that kind of news. Um, in, in a moment, though, when you, when you step back and think about, about the reality of life and just how fragile it is, um, the reality is that probably 50,000 people die every day. And that's not to make light of death at all. It actually brings out the seriousness of it. Um, and every year, on any given day, you can find a tragedy that's happened in history. Um, as of Friday, which was the 16th, which was the day that the shooting in Indianapolis happened, um, one author went back just to kind of point this out. He said, on, the, on that day, um, on the 16th, in 2017, a college senior killed 32 people on the campus of Virginia Tech. Uh, in 2014, the South Korean ferry Sewol capsized and sank, killing 304 people, most of whom were high schoolers. In 2011, on that date, a Taliban sleeper agent detonated a vest of explosives hidden under his uniform, which killed six American soldiers, four Afghan soldiers, and an interpreter. In looking back in history, in 1947, a ship carrying ammonium nitrate blew up in the harbor in Texas City, Texas. The blast killed nearly 600 people. A couple years before that, 1945, a Soviet submarine in the Baltic Sea torpedoed and sank the MV Goya, which was a, uh, a German ship, which was transporting civilians, refugees, and soldiers. 7,000 people died on that day. And again, it's not to make light of any of this, but actually to prove the point that, you know, we tend to look at the here and the now and the sensational, but the reality is that um, death is around us all the time. Uh, life is fragile. Uh, which also shows just how precious life is, if we're going to be honest, and, and we all know that. 
And I think that uh, I only say these things because I think it's important for us to kind of sometimes step back and, and look at the big picture and understand that, you know, a lot of the things that we become so focused on are, are just blips on the radar in the span of time. And I think that, you know, as we pray, especially as we pray for, for, for folks who are not feeling well, for folks who are grieving because of death in the family, uh, we don't take those things lightly. We actually take them very seriously. Uh, and, and, um, but, we, but we also understand that God's in control of all these things, and not one of us is promised tomorrow. So we thank him for the gift that we have for today and pray that we do not take it lightly. Is there any other prayer requests this morning? If not, then let's go ahead and turn to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning uh, thankful to be gathered together in your name. Uh, we are just overjoyed that you have called us out of darkness and into light, and you use us uh, for your purposes here on earth. Um, I pray that uh, as we grow on in our, in our Christian walk, that we would continue to grow deeper in our understanding of you, uh, deeper in our appreciation for the uh, wonderful gift that you've given us in eternal life, uh, that we would never grow uh, weary of giving you thanks for forgiveness of our sins, um, and that these things would, would motivate us to share your love uh, with people around us, with people uh, that we know in our lives, our friends, our family, our coworkers, uh, but also that we would look for opportunities to uh, share the good news of you uh, with those who we don't know yet. Um, this is the reason that you have put us on, on earth, that we are remain uh, here, is to spread the, the good news of your son Jesus. And, and I pray that that would... Uh, that would bring us great joy. Uh, as always, it is also a joy to come before you with our, our needs. Uh, this morning, you know, we, we lift up especially Della as, as she is in the hospital, not feeling well. We pray that you would uh, touch her body and heal her, that you would uh, be with her husband as he struggles um, with, with the current situation. And above all, Lord, we pray that you, you would just allow her to uh, return home uh, very soon. Um, as uh, we also think of Ronnie and Shannon, as they are just uh, struggling with uh, not feeling well, we pray that uh, it would not be anything serious and that they both would uh, be able to get back to, uh, back to normalcy uh, rather soon. Um, I also uh, lift up, I forgot to mention, but, uh, you know, as, as uh, my daughter Emily works over at uh, Amherst Meadows, there is a uh, uh, stomach bug going through the nursing home, which is uh, creating lots of work for all the uh, nurses' aides and all, and all them. We pray that uh, you would be with all of them, uh, be with all the patients and the residents. Uh, pray that, uh, you know, that this comes to an end and there really is no, uh, no further issues. Uh, be with all the staff that are caring for the patients there uh, as they uh, attend to their duties and pray that you would keep them healthy uh, throughout that process also. Um, as Becky mentioned, Lord, we continue to lift up the camp. Um, it is exciting that summer is coming, and uh, campers will soon be uh, filling the cabins, and uh, we pray that you would uh, prepare the ground and prepare the soil for them. Uh, for all those kids that are going to be attending there this summer, we pray that you would open their minds and hearts. Uh, for all the adults that are going to be working with those kids, we pray that they would, um, that they would uh, have patience and, and represent you well. Uh, that in the times leading up to camp, they would prepare themselves, prepare their hearts and minds to uh, provide a, a fun uh, experience um, that's full of joy for the campers and that really points them towards you. Lord, as we uh, recount uh, the, the many deaths that go on in our world, you know, uh, we spoke about the uh, shootings just in our area in the last week or so. Um, it, it is... It's heartbreaking. Uh, we never, ever want to see uh, anyone lose their life, especially at the hands of another. Um, but, Lord, we do ask that you would give us uh, level heads as we think about this. We pray for all the families who are grieving and struggling uh, at this time, uh, not just from, from these deaths, but really from death in general. Uh, it seems to consume our news these days, uh, and we know uh, that life is not um, life is not guaranteed for us. Uh, we have no clue when our day is going to come. 
Uh, and in that light, Lord, we thank you for this moment. We, we thank you uh, to have breath in our lungs. Uh, we, we thank you to be here in this very moment, uh, gathered in your name. And I pray that we would not take it for granted. And I pray that we would every day bless you for the life that you have given us, uh, that we would seek to use it to further uh, the spread of the gospel, uh, that your kingdom would grow here on earth. Um, and that in the midst of all the tragedy that we see around us, we truly would be a beacon of light and hope uh, because we do have a message that brings life. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would open our, our minds and hearts and give us courage uh, to share that message uh, whenever we have opportunity. And now as we open your word, I pray that you would open our minds, that you would open our hearts, that we would be uh, open to hearing what you have for us, that we would uh, receive your truth and that it would change us, Lord. Uh, we ask all this in your son's name. Amen. Well, today we are continuing our, our uh, I guess, the closure of the end of, of Luke uh, after the resurrection. Last week we looked at the, uh, Emmaus, the, road, the disciples on the road to Emmaus. This week we are going to be finishing out chapter 24. Uh, I've titled today's message, When Believing is Hard. I think sometimes, if we're going to be honest, it can be very difficult uh, for you and I, for people we know, to really believe God in the middle of the huge difficulties that we face. Sometimes there's questions that, that arise in us. You know, how can God allow these things to happen in our own lives, in the lives of people that we know, that we love? Here are some questions that were submitted to an online ministry. Okay, think about these, and how often do you know people, or maybe you yourself have had these questions? First one says this, how can I hold on to my faith in God when things go wrong? As a Christian, I know I'm supposed to give thanks in all things and look to the Lord for my daily needs, yet I've been through some devastating experiences over the past year. How can I be thankful and trust God at a time like this? Someone else writes this, they say, our preacher keeps telling us to put our trust in God and live it every day according to his, his promises but I have a hard time doing this. Does faith just come harder to some people like me than it does to others? I think it's a legitimate question. Third person, just putting it very short and kind of bluntly, says, why is it so hard for me to have faith in God? Well, I think as you think of all the things going on in the world around us, it's probably a very valid question that a lot of people have, especially probably people that have grown up in the church. And then look around and say, how can God allow all this to go on around us? And I think it's important for us to acknowledge that there are times in our life and there are situations where it really is hard to believe. It, it's hard to believe. And if there's ever a place where we should be able to express the difficulties or the disbelief, it should be within the church, but so often the opposite really is the case, isn't it? Well, today, as I said, we're going to be in uh, Luke chapter 24. Uh, we're going to start back a little bit from where we were last week, just to kind of set the stage. Uh, verse 32, you know, it talks about the two disciples that were walking on the road to Emmaus, and uh, as Jesus revealed himself to them and then disappeared, we pick it up in verse 32. It says, And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. 
And that's where we ended last week. And if you remember, we talked about the fact that, you know, this was so important to these two disciples that as evening was approaching, they couldn't sit still and they actually returned to Jerusalem, a seven-mile walk that would have taken them probably two and a half to three hours. They get back there, they share this good news. And then we pick it up here in verse 36. It says, now as they said these things, Jesus himself stood in the midst of them and said to them, peace to you. But they were terrified and frightened and supposed they had seen a spirit. Now, that is very in line with other accounts throughout the scriptures of uh, either God appearing to people or angels appearing to people. Quite often, the first thing they say is, right, be not afraid. Because there's a certain level of fear that happens. And so often, you know, I think we ought to be terrified and afraid in approaching God, but we, we don't take it, uh, you know, the same. Um, God's holiness is something we tend to not uh, elevate, but we rather we want to bring him down to our level and make it uh, just normal. But God, Jesus appears to the disciples, and they are terrified, thinking they had seen a ghost. Verse 38, he said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts arise in your heart? Behold, my hands and my feet, that it is I myself. Handle, handle me and see, for his spirit does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. But while they still did not believe for joy and marveled, he said to them, have you any food here? So they gave him a piece of broiled fish and some honeycomb, and he took it and ate it in their presence. This first reaction of the disciples, as we said, is kind of a normal response to God appearing to people within the scriptures. That's something that's referred to as a theophany. God appearing to man. It's a manifestation of God. Their doubt, their disbelief, leads them to conclude that they saw a ghost. This is very similar to it, back in the book of Samuel when, when, um, when a ghost appears. At first, it's they saw a ghost. They were still not ready to find the faith required to accept the truth of what they were seeing. At this point, remember, the, the Holy Spirit had not been sent yet. These are disciples trying to comprehend in their own power, their own human nature. And think also of how much evidence they had to discount in order to still question this. All of Jesus', Jesus previous predictions regarding his own life, they had to discount the women's witness, the women who went to the tomb and came back reporting that he was no longer there. They had to discount Peter's experience as he then went to the tomb and, and returned. Then these two that were on the road to Emmaus and came back telling them the story, they had to discount that also. And now Jesus is standing in front of them. So in this moment, these people who would be the apostles doubt the very thing they're seeing in front of them. And I think that this should be a section of scripture that we walk through with everyone who is questioning. Because if these people are okay in their doubtfulness, in their unbelief, why do we put such a stigma on it? Here's the thing, Jesus can handle it. Jesus can stand up to our questioning. He can stand up to our, our disbelief. What does he say in there? He says, he says, behold my hands and feet. 
handle me. See. If you have doubts, handle me. See for yourself. When people have doubts, what do we tend to do? I think sometimes we just want to answer the question. So we who maybe have been Christians for a while, uh, we, we look at their doubts, we know they're legitimate, but we have an answer for it. So we might just, off the tongue, give an answer that should solve their problem. But what we know, what we should know, is that doubts don't usually come from a lack of knowledge or a lack of intellect, right? They come from emotions a lot of times, feelings. Quite often those feelings are attached to experiences. So what folks need in that moment is not just an answer to solve their problem. They need someone to come alongside of them, right? Someone to come alongside of them and help them to see Jesus, to handle him, to reveal him as he is in the scriptures, and let Christ speak for himself. Those who have doubts are actually encouraged to dive in and see the Jesus who actually is, not the one who they think is. See Jesus as he's revealed in Scripture. So often that is the issue. We see things going around us and we interpret things and apply them to God that probably are misapplied. Or we've created a Jesus in our minds that isn't the one that's actually revealed in Scripture. Author Os Guinness has this to say about doubt. He says, to believe is to be in one mind about accepting something to be true. To disbelieve is to be in one mind about rejecting it. To doubt is to waver between the two. To believe and to disbelieve at once. And so be in two minds. This should echo of the scripture where, you know, we read the the person says, I believe, help my unbelief, right? You're, You're wavering. There's still doubt there. The heart of doubt is a divided heart. Doubt is a state of mind in suspension between faith and unbelief, so that it is neither of them wholly and is each of them only partly. Again, to believe is to be in one mind, and to doubt is to be in two minds. Doubt as double-mindedness is the definition of the author. Moreover, what is doubt but faith suffering from mistreatment and malnutrition? So the answer for doubt is to be fed. Well, as Christians, we feed on the word of God. So that is the place where we are to go. Uh, It reminds me of a a phrase I've heard some time ago, and I think it applies so well uh, to most Christians. And it goes like this. It says, uh, I have too much of the Lord in me to enjoy the world, but yet too much of the world in me to truly enjoy the Lord. And this constant tug, I think, is something we all struggle with. And that tug, I think, coupled with the situations around us, lead to doubt, to this double-mindedness. In practice, then, we end up doubting the Scriptures, and then we become sure of ourselves. We know according to our own minds, our own feelings, our own senses, And therefore, we're slow to believe the scriptures. G.K. Chesterton said this. He said, a man was meant to be doubtful about himself, but undoubting about the truth. This has been exactly reversed. And I think he's spot on. Uh, We live in a world that elevates the self. We have this notion of a true self that lives somewhere within this flesh and bones that, that we have, right? And that if we're going to really enjoy life, if we're going to really sometimes even glorify God, then we have to fulfill this true self, whoever or whatever it may be. Uh, That is a notion that is completely uh, not found in Scripture. You know, the Scriptures tell us we're to die to ourselves. 
live for Christ. Modern day goes completely opposite of that. And so this tension is around us all the time. Now, in the scripture, especially in the passage that we just read, Luke is actually pretty soft when he talks about uh, the doubt of the disciples. He portrays it really just as kind of this doubt. They're, They're not real certain. What's interesting is Mark, in his recounting of this, he's a little more hard. He says this, he says, later he, being Jesus, appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. And what does he say Jesus said? He rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him after he has risen. We put these things together, and really what we find, and we find this elsewhere in Scripture too, is that the struggle to believe, uh, what sometimes we call doubt, is actually unbelief. It's a level of unbelief. But doubt sounds nicer, so quite often we just go with doubt. So if you sat down to talk to someone about their doubts, it's much easier than to talk to them about their unbelief. But yet the two are in some sense the same. We doubt because of a certain level of unbelief. So, what's the solution for this then? What's this, this wavering that, that we talk about, this being pulled back and forth between the world, ourselves, and, and the scriptures, and Christ? What's the solution? Is it for us to study harder? Is it to just force ourselves to stop thinking of ourselves? Which is almost impossible, right? It's kind of like taking that big beach ball and trying to hold it underwater. Right, when you're in a pool. You can do it for a little bit, but then it's going to pop up, and it comes up, you know, not gently. That's kind of what happens when we try to repress ourselves, right, and just will ourselves to do something. We can do it for a short time, but eventually nature takes over. Let's look and see what is it that Jesus does for these disciples. Verse 44. Then he said to them, These are the words which I spoke to you while I was still with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms concerning me. And he opened their understanding that they might comprehend the scriptures. What we see here and what we saw actually last week with the disciples on the road to Emmaus Understanding comes from God. Their eyes weren't opened. Last week, the disciples' eyes weren't open until they sat down and broke bread with Jesus. Here, Jesus chastises the disciples for their doubt, for their unbelief, and what's his answer? The answer is he himself. He opens their understanding. So one thing that I think we need to be careful of here, too, is that we, we take what we see as understanding and, and, and interpret that to mean um, just knowledge of the scriptures, that, right? That we're being a scholar kind of thing, that you have all the answers for everything in the Bible. And I don't think that's what Jesus was talking about. Because what was the, the thing that they were struggling with? It wasn't It didn't have to do with their knowledge of the scriptures. It had to do with their understanding of how the scriptures applied to Christ, how he was the fulfillment of the promises. That was where their struggle was. That's really what was opened to them. These are folks who would have grown up in the synagogue, right? They would have heard the scriptures from a young age. They would have had that knowledge, They were lacking the understanding about how those things pointed to Christ and how Christ fulfilled all those things. So the thing that we first need to do is not just dive into the Bible, pray that God gives us understanding and try to learn all this so we have answers for people, but what we first need is trust. Trust that Jesus really is the answer for all these things, not just the promises and prophecies in scripture but the things in our own life 
Trust is so often what we are lacking. Why is that so important? Let's look at verse 46 and on. Then he, Jesus, said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. Behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry in the city of Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. It is so vitally important for us to trust Jesus. Often in spite of of our level of understanding, it's so important for us to trust him because this mission is huge. Can you imagine those first disciples hearing him say this and say that you are going to be my witnesses to all nations? It took two disciples over six hours just to walk to the next town and come back. And they're going to be disciples to the whole globe, all nations? I mean, that's, it's literally impossible if you think about it. But this is the mission Christ has given the church. One commentator writes this about this passage. He says, in spite of all the times this had been addressed, especially Jesus revealing himself to his followers, none of his followers had been able to grasp the reality of what was coming. It was too far out of their religious experience and expectations, so they misunderstood the God-intended meaning of the prophecies. Jesus now clears away the debris of false understanding and enables them to grasp the truth. The doubts that dominated their thinking are now over once and for all. So in this, the opposite of doubt is not knowledge, but trust. Not only the reality of the cross and the empty tomb, but also the scriptural prophecies that foretold these events are now clearly perceived. There are two areas presented here in Jesus' statement to them. Two areas. One, the passion and the resurrection. Now, we tend to know that is the important part of the gospel, right? Jesus died, was buried, and rose again. But that information is just information and really isn't meaningful unless it somehow applies to you and I. We can tell people all day long about how Jesus overcame death, rose again. It doesn't mean anything to them unless we tell them how it can, right? Which is the second part of what Jesus said. That repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name. So we have the passion, the resurrection, and then the mission of the church. And what does he tell them? You are witnesses of all these things. They are sharing a message that comes from their background, their lived experience, their knowledge of now their new understanding of who Christ is, what he came to do, but also he says, you've witnessed these things. This is what you're to go share, what you're to go tell. Witnessing then is something that all of us are called to do, but yet all of us struggle with mightily. And I think it's found in us misunderstanding the nature of it. It's actually, we're like those disciples who disbelieved, who had doubts about Jesus right in front of them. Right? They thought it was too good to be true. Well, we can be the same way. What do you, you're going to use me? I don't have the answers, God. I'm supposed to share you with these people? What if they have questions? I can't, I can't do it. I think first of all, It's understanding that witnessing is not something we do for God. That's where we approach it most times. It's something that we're doing for God. That's not the way it is. It's something he does through 
us. And he has equipped you to do it. There's the trust thing. He's equipped you to do it. There's a big difference between having a good sales pitch and a spirit-empowered witness. Big difference. People do not come to Christ because they heard a great argument. Simon Peter came to Jesus because Andrew went after him with what? A testimony. We go forth then in the authority of his name, with the power of his spirit, telling the story of his grace. And one component of that is how has his grace impacted you? That is the foundation and the explosion of the early church. And as we move forward from where we are today and we go into the book of Acts, we will see this time and time again. Preach the name of Jesus, he told them. Call for repentance. Promise forgiveness. This is what the scriptures said would happen. This is what they were called to do. This is the mission of the church. Folks, this is the mission that we are given. But in order to really accomplish it, we have to get out of our own way. We have to stop making it harder than it is. We have to trust God that he's going to use us in spite of our fumbling over our own words, in spite of us not having all the answers. He certainly used somebody to reach you, so why can't you be the one to reach someone else? And at the heart of this, I think that what we really need is to fall in love with Christ again. To fall in love with the gospel again. And from that point, we can go forth with a God-centered message, a God-given mission, all to his glory. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, uh, we come before you uh, and and we believe. uh, But help our unbelief, Lord. We find ourselves so often torn, uh, torn between what we read in the scriptures and then, on the other hand, our lived experience, which is filled with difficulties, with challenges, uh, with our own insecurities. Uh, Lord, help us to understand uh, your mission for us. Help us to understand that uh, sharing your love is not something we do for you, but something you use us to do. You, You do it through us. It's wholly empowered by your spirit. So help us to rely on your spirit more and more. Help us to pray each day, Lord, that that we would recognize opportunities in front of us, that we would recognize your work in us. God, grant us that we might trust you in the middle of difficult times, in the middle of danger. God, grant us that we might trust your plan to reach the nations in your power and not in ours. Uh, Lord, we ask these things in your son's precious name. Amen. All right, if you would, please turn in your red hymnals to hymn number 257 and stand as we sing, Standing on the Promises of God. Uh, One note, I I loaded this in my software today and forgot to double check to make sure it's the same one in the red hymnal. So, So I might have to ask you just to take out the hymnal so we can be certain.
May Christ dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the fullness of God. Amen.